Uh, this is an artwork called Rainbow Sunset by artist Trippy Yogi. And Trippy Yogi is an artist who plays with extremely vivid colors, almost like psychedelic, very popping out of the screen. And yeah, so this is a video art and you can turn on the sound. I would describe this as like a really pleasant, interesting to look at, slightly psychedelic digital spinning rainbow sun on top of a shimmering ocean. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that <laughs> describes it really well. Uh, and then there's the sound also, which is kind of like spherical, wavy sound, I don't know. Yeah. In this episode, we dive deep into the world of digital art or crypto art. What are NFTs and how can something that is widely available online still be valuable? In crypto art, everybody sees it, but only one owns it. That's kind of like a poetic summation of the paradigm shift. How did the digital art market seemingly blow up overnight? And why should you care? Fast forward to 2020, we were starting to do about 100K a month in volume. So artists started selling you know, $100,000 a month of art. And then it's 10X since there. So the past three months or so, we've broken over a million dollars in sales a month. Hello and welcome to Unforkable, the podcast that brings you juicy stories straight from the blockchain. Today on the show, we have a very special guest. My name is Jonathan Perkins, and I'm a co-founder and a chief product officer at SuperRare. So SuperRare is a uh, digital art market built on Ethereum. Um, so it's been around since about uh, early 2018. We talk about the beginnings of SuperRare and how difficult it was to convince people to take digital art seriously. The number one most important thing in this space is to grow it and bring more collectors in. In 2018, when we launched, people were like, we talked to investors and other people in the space, and they'd be like, did you say art? Like, like what? Like, what are you guys doing? Like, do you hate money? Like, what, <laughs> like why would you do that to yourselves? Like, clearly, NFTs are for gaming. There's this sense of like, what are you trying to sell me here? I can just download this JPEG. There's no market for this stuff. Like, why would I pay money for this silly token? We also discuss how these silly tokens turned into the NFT boom that is currently going on. From digital art to collectibles to things in between, like CryptoPunks. And we also look behind the scenes to try figuring out who are the people who buy all these tokens. I mentioned my dad earlier, he's just like in disbelief uh, that like, you know, Super is doing about a million dollars every month in, uh, in volume. So artists are earning, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And that begs the question of who are these uh, collectors doing this? But before we start, let's quickly address our sponsor today. CryptoValley.jobs is a job board where engineers, designers, analysts, traders, and community builders can find cool crypto jobs. Full disclosure, I run this job board as a side project of this podcast. And sponsors of the pod can advertise for free on the job board. In the beginning, the jobs you will find there will most likely be based in Switzerland or remotely. But in the spirit of decentralization, and since there's not one single crypto hub in the world, the job board will grow to locations all over the globe. So please go and visit CryptoValley.jobs and sign up on the email list and get informed once a week when new jobs are posted on the platform. That's CryptoValley.jobs. And now let's start the show. Let's jump right into it. Uh, it's quite ambitious program I have for you today. <laughs> All right, I'm excited. <laughs> Could you give us a quick introduction about uh, yourself and with the name and what you're doing, what your position is? Yeah, so my name is Jonathan Perkins and I'm a co-founder and uh, chief product officer at SuperRare. SuperRare is a uh, digital art market built on Ethereum. You can kind of think about it like Christie's meets Instagram. Um, so it's a purely online platform for digital art, where this global network of artists are constantly creating, selling, trading digital artworks. And there's a, a you know, again, on the other side, a big network of collectors um, who are collecting art. And it's all backed up by non-fungible tokens. 
on the Ethereum blockchain. Great. And I think that's a great um, keyword. You just mentioned the non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Even like people who are seasoned in crypto seem to have troubles to wrap their heads around. The other day, um, stumbled upon a tweet from Peter McCormack, a famous Bitcoin podcaster, and he tweeted, I screen grabbed your NFT, now I own it. Yeah, uh, that, was, that was a great tweet. He's a great Twitter personality. <laughs> <laughs> But can you, I mean, there's a lot to un unpack there. I mean, what is an NFT and why doesn't that work? What we just said, if I just green grab your NFT, uh, that I own it. Um, it's a great question. Uh, to be fair, it's not the easiest thing to wrap your head around. It's you know part of my job to just like have this conversation with people. My dad's 84 years old and like, you know, I've finally gotten him over the years to understand what Ethereum is and what a uh, non-fungible token is. But, um, you know, just, anyway, there's a whole spectrum in a nutshell, as the name implies, um, unlike a, a US dollar or a Bitcoin or an Ether, which are all interchangeable, it doesn't really matter which one you own. A non-fungible token is a bit more like a house or a car or a plane ticket. Like it really matters which one you have and you probably don't want to trade one for the other without knowing more details. I think about them like digital objects or digital goods. Um, and the reason this is cool and important is that for the first time we have scarcity within these digital goods. If I email you a photo, you have the photo and I obviously still have the photo. It's not like gone from my computer. Um, in contrast, if I give you a hundred dollar bill, it's extremely important that I also don't still have a hundred dollars. Bitcoin really pioneered this in the digital space. Unlike a photo, if I send you a Bitcoin, you have it now and I don't have it anymore. Um, so that's the scarcity aspect. And so these NFTs use cases range from what we're doing with artists, authenticated digital art to, you know, video game items, to, um, sports collectibles, to concert tickets, like you name it. Like there's, there's a lot of teams working on really, really cool stuff in the space. Um, but it all kind of comes down to this concept of like, it's a digital object with unique properties that is scarce. You can own it. And then if you sell it, like you don't own it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. if I go to the super rare website right now, um, ju I just did that this morning. I went to the most expensive listed artwork. It's 21 mm -hmm. million ether. And I right clicked it and I downloaded it. Did I just do the highest of the century? Did I just steal 21 million ether? Oh uh, man, you did. You, how did you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, right. Uh, back to Peter's tweet. Um, I actually like to kind of draw an analogy in my mind. One of the first instances of digital scarcity is actually the domain name. So if you think about like web domain names, it's a shared registry. And so if we're talking about like www you know, facebook.com, there's only one of those because the whole world agrees that there's this one registry of domains and whoever has that .com owns it, they control it. So you can screenshot a domain name, but you don't control it. You can't put a website on it. You can't sell it. So that's kind of high level, like to bring it back to the artwork it becomes conceptual and it's like a totally fair question. It seems kind of crazy. Like people are used to media being free and infinitely copyable. I can download movies, you know, for music, like we're all grew up in the digital generation. But the important thing to understand with Super Rare is the files are not scarce. Like in no way are we trying to pioneer new like DRM, digital rights management. This is not about blocking access to the art for anybody. And so it kind of turns the art on its head in a way. We get this question all the time, typically from people from the art world of like, oh, well, it's like cryptographic art, right? So it means it's like hidden for everyone who doesn't own it. Um, you know, and you think the analogy from the art world is like, if I own a sculpture, I can put it in my basement and hide it. Mm -hmm. So when we first started out, people kept asking me like, oh, well, how do I hide it? And we were like, oh, this is weird. Like this, you know, this one person thinks they're like, they're asking about hiding the art. like. I'll never get that question again. But then like tons of people kept you know, asking that. Um, and so it's, it's certainly not about hiding the art or restricting access to it. In fact, it's the complete opposite. We embrace the fact that the file is not scarce because we do have the scarce certificate of authenticity 
this digital object that was created and signed directly by the private keys of the artists themselves on Superware. You can't take a screenshot of it. Just like you can take a screenshot of, you know, a wallet with 10 Bitcoin in it, but, uh, you know, you can't transfer them, you can't sell them. Mm -hmm. And the more people that download it, the better, to be honest. If you're the owner of the certificate of an artwork that everyone in the world has seen and downloaded, then that's probably the most valuable artwork in the world. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, just to, to wrap this up with the NFT, um, what you're trading, what you buy on superair.co is basically like a certificate that says, this is the artwork you own and you trade the certificate while the artwork, the pixels that you see, the ones and zeros, they're not scarce. Like each person who can consume the product, which is basically everybody, you can, not, you can still not control that, has exactly the same quality of the image or the video or whatever the digital artwork is, but only one person owns like a certificate that proves it belongs to them. Yeah, exactly. That's a great summation. There's an Italian artist duo called Hakatau um, that uh, coined a phrase very early on in, in 2018 with a, a tweet that said, in crypto art, everybody sees it, but only one owns it. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of like a poetic summation of the paradigm shift. Um, but I think it really works well with the internet because, you know, the, there's the saying information wants to be free. And I think that's very true on the internet. And so the idea of restricting access as a linchpin of your, of your model, I don't think works on the internet. And the perfect example of this is Apple. I mean, a Apple, like the biggest and most successful tech company in the world literally tried to have their music system be based on DRM and they moved away from it because it, it wasn't working. So I think embracing the fact that the nature of the internet and of what people want to do is share and copy, lean into that and say, say sure, the more famous this artwork gets, the better. Um, you know, like everyone can see and download a picture of the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. but there's only one and it sits in the museum. Mm -hmm. And so that's the analogy with, if you own the NFT, you own the real thing in the museum. And everyone else can, can like Google it and see, see it, but you have the artwork as intended and created by the artist. But the certificate, I mean, uh, super Air, first of all, is a platform, right? And you mm -hmm. guys do some human work there. You kind of uh, make sure that this artwork is listed here for the first time. And, you know, like what, what would happen if an artist goes to two platforms at the same time with the same artwork? Does that have an influence or am I thinking about this in the wrong way? No, not at all. That's a great question. Um, from the start, we have done our best to build SuperRare as a social platform. Um, so it's not anonymous. You can see, or it's, it's, it's kind of like Twitter. It's like pseudonymous. Everyone has a username. The reason we did that is because if you look at the traditional art world, reputation uh, is really one really fundamental layer um, and not just the art world, like, you know, many, many different markets and, and systems. And so to, to answer your question, it really comes down to the reputation of the artist. So if you're a, say, uh, fine art photographer and you, you're selling limited prints of, t you know, say 10 black and white uh, photos that are signed and additioned and you tell the, these collect these 10 collectors that they have a one of 10 edition, there's nothing in the technology stopping you from going and, and printing another 10 in your dark room. Um, but what happens in that case is your reputation would take a hit. Those collectors would probably like the value would go down. Those collectors uh, would talk about it and you probably wouldn't be able to sell stuff again in the future. And so that's really the same thing in this case. Um, so we, we're not trying to like control what artists do. We're just trying to like blockchains are very good at creating transparency within systems. Um, so it's quite easy to verify one that like who minted this artwork on a different platform and, you know, two, if our, an artist like, you know, mints two things saying they're each one of one. And to be honest, it doesn't really happen. We're like three years into super rare and, um, that's, you know, there's many areas for improvement and problems that come up, but that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's not really one of them. Yeah. Basically. Um, so, so what I heard from, 
I mean, at, at the end, the artwork, the quality to to it is really always super hard, right? Like, is is this like a superb artwork itself? But I personally believe that a lot of it is kind of the marketing behind and the story behind uh, those artworks. So the reputation, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. is super important. So nobody would kind of do that fraud uh, in that sense because. The story is important, uh, the symbolic meaning of the artwork, especially the ones which are very valuable. Um, there, there's like a study by artfacts.net in the traditional uh, art market that shows kind of like that all of the financially successful artists, uh, they basically start with a handful of art galleries. Like the art galleries are kind of the kingmakers in the art world. Um, do you see something like that happening also for digital art? Do you think Superware is that place, for instance, where, where those kind of artists are born um, compared to other platforms? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, what we're trying to do is foster a more peer-to-peer model where artists are much more in control. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I, th- I think, again, I think it's kind of a natural evolution of uh, what the internet has done. Like, you know, like record labels are, are far less powerful than they were a while ago, or, you know, like a, a decade or two ago, because they don't control the distribution anymore. And, you know, with the internet and with, with crypto art, we're, we're really like putting the artists in control. And sure, each each platform has its own kind of stipulations, like on Super Rare, everything is currently just single edition art. But beyond that, Artists can really create as they see fit. Whereas if you look at many traditional gallery contracts, it's very much, you know, there's a a wide variety, but it's not uncommon to find the gallery kind of like dictating what the artist should put out or like how much or how it should be priced for. And it's really not like creative freedom for the artists. And so our philosophy is, is really to like provide the tools for this ecosystem to flourish and kind of get out of the way and let people let like. Let the, let the creators be creative and like let the market uh, evolve mm. uh, in an efficient way. Mm. Hey, by the way, we are only recording the sound, but I think okay. that podcasts are a super visual medium as well. And I sent you uh, some links to some artworks and maybe you can open them step by step. Okay. And I would be interested in you just, um, you know, activating your mm. imagination and kind of like, explain and describe what you see uh, but you can also give some context if you know the artist for instance or whatever you want to add but just like to paint a picture because what i would try to do is like to show how um, you know like digital art what, what is digital art actually um through audio um yeah uh this is awesome this is way more fun than than my interviews <laughs> <laughs> um all right, cool. Yeah, so uh, I've opened the artwork on Super Rare that you just linked me, um, and this one is really interesting. This is an art uh, an artwork titled "Click to Transmute" um, by the artist Pock. Pock is a really interesting artist who came on the scene, I believe, yeah, in early 2020, and is, is kind of like um, taking the crypto art world by storm. Uh, very, very, very successful artist in the market extremely active community member responsible for breaking um, many new passionate people into the space. And his artworks often are very minimalist and black and white um, and geometric. They often are kind of like very enigmatic and give you the sense that there's something behind the scenes. There's like a hidden message or something you need to like dig deeper to, to understand that's that's kind of generally like the the sense i get from pox uh, artworks um and this one you said is like is is quite literally that actually so what i'm looking at here when i just uh load the artwork is a white orb on a white table or surface um with complex shadows around it that kind of looks like a ping pong ball sitting on a white table if you click on the image however it enlarges and completely changes uh, into a translucent ball that looks kind of like a globe of ice sitting on a black mirrored surface. Uh, so it's pretty shocking. It's like a completely, uh, complete visual change. Um, and 
this kind of blew my mind when I, <laughs> when it first got tokenized on Super. I'm not gonna lie. And um, that one is the first one I've seen um, where something like that happens. What happened there? This change that you can click it. Uh, is that something you, a super air, offer, or is that some a workaround that this artist has done to kind of um, change the image, or is that what, what am I looking at just to understand what, how did that happen? It's not a video. It's not a. It only happens when you click. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's it's basically a consequence of the artist being extremely extremely clever and uh like i said it was a surprise even to us who built the website so we did, we did not work with them to do this um and actually it's it's a png um so many people know pngs unlike jpegs have the possibility to be partially transparent mm -hmm. and on many websites like if you enlarge an image it pops out and gets this black background um, and so Pac identified this about the super Rare website and crafted this PNG such that if it's on the white normal background, it looks kind of like uh, like you'd expect the artwork to look, um, like the ball sitting on the table. But if you pop it, there's a partial transparency that um, that kind of kicks in on the black background and makes it look like completely different. So wow. it's like it's kind of okay. like visual trick wow. trickery, which is pr pretty awesome. That's really awesome. And I just, um, I figured this out. Well, I didn't figure it out actually. It was rather random that I found this one. <laughs> oh, nice. I mean, I, I looked for, maybe we have to say that Puck is also, I, I assume, the most successful in financial terms uh, artist on, on your website. Would you agree? Yeah. 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 He is, um, yeah, he was the first artist to cross the thousand ether threshold earned oh. a few weeks back and um if you count it based on today's eth price like not historical mm -hmm. like on super every track them based on like the time of the sale like what was eth worth at the time of the sale because mm -hmm. all the sales currently happen with ETH. um but yeah if you track it uh, in that way then Pac has earned over a million dollars um in the crypto art scene in 2020 wow uh, which is in one year which is an astonishing you, yeah that's amazing can we uh i want to continue with the uh, with the artwork afterwards but uh, as we are on this theme with numbers and money earned i assume that i mean the million dollars that's really like an outlier and then the next one will be a significant drop and then what would be a more realistic picture for let's say an average artist or how, how can you kind of describe this curve when it, when it comes to earning on super rare um, yeah, that's a good question. If you've read the book, The Long Tail or, or, or similar things like that, that look at the distribution of um, whether, you know, it can be like popularity or social media followings or YouTube mm. uh, channels with, uh, with the most followers or, you know, the market uh, cap of record crypto. sales, <laughs> the market cap of crypto, um, you know, there's this, there's this distribution phenomenon that I think is very human um in which there's a few outliers that stand taller than most market participants and then a long tail um and so that's certainly played out um and super rare and pretty much every you know like the rest of the the kind of the nft space as far as i can tell um and you know it's not like we were trying to design it that way um but if you look under the hood there's it's actually quite incredible the diversity of artists and the number of artists that are able to make a living from crypto art and then like the number of artists that are able to like you know say help pay their rent um i actually tweeted this stat last week that i found just kind of digging through our, our stats in the past 30 days more than 114 artists had sold an artwork for at least a thousand dollars and that's you know that's rent in uh, many cities in the rich world um, and so I'm, I'm really proud of that. And then, you know, if you look at Twitter or talk to people in the scene, I mean, there's literally people who, you know, left the city they lived in to go move to the coast and bought, bought a new house. And these are artists who are, you know, some of whom like have day jobs or were able to leave their day jobs due to this kind of emerging power of the digital art market. Mm. Um, so yeah, pretty incredible stuff happening. Cool. So cool. What are digital art characteristics they're only possible because they are on a uh, digital art 
Like for instance, that clicking, uh, I think it's one of the examples, but where could that go? What, what else is out there and possible? What kind of creative ways have you seen um, to use the, this kind of digital artworks? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I mean, I think even just simply, you know, motion, the humble animated GIF uh, is, is still one of my favorite forms of digital art. We launched Super Rare with still images and GIFs. If you have a digital frame on your wall, just having an artwork that lives and moves and changes and has motion is pretty revolutionary. Um, we added video support in, in 2019, and then we added support for 3D objects, like vectorized 3D sculptures that can be made in you know, kind of infinite number of ways. So now we have, with video art, we have longer form animated possibilities with full stereo sound. Um, we're getting into really, really cool possibilities with multimedia, kind of like the second one you shared, Rainbow Sunset here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's um, go to that one then. Okay, cool. Um, this is an artwork called Rainbow Sunset by artist Trippy Yogi. I would describe this as like a really pleasant, interesting to look at, slightly psychedelic digital, like spinning rainbow sun on top of a shimmering ocean. <laughs> yeah. I think that that <laughs> describes it really well. Uh, and then there's the sound also, which is kind of like spherical, wavy sound. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, like a, a music track with really like, uh, again, slightly trippy, uh, like stereo sweeping music. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this is an artwork that uh, has gotten a few offers, has not sold yet. Um, and is currently listing it for about five ETH. Which is a lot of money still. Uh, yeah, I like, I can't afford this, for example. Yeah, I couldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> when you see such a price, is that um, a regular price for, for a digital artwork? It, I mean, do you have some context now to this? Uh, apparently, you know Trip, Trip Yoga, Yogi. I'm not sure if you know all of the artists on your platform. I guess uh, it's going to be tough to know all of them. I did in the early days when we started out, we literally just like hopped on the phone with every single person and chatted with them on video and stuff. Now there's well over 500 artists and we're starting to onboard at a higher rate. Um, so that's not possible anymore, but it's a tight knit community. And if you're as embedded as I am, you get to know the cast of characters pretty well. Okay. Yeah. All right, then let's go to the next one. I think this one uh, will blow people's mind because it has a lot of different uh, characteristics to it. Yeah, totally. So this one's really interesting and uh, it's kind of, it invites a whole other host of questions about the metaverse and where the digital universe is leading us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, this artwork is called Rebirth of Venus and it's a kind of virtual self-portrait by the artist Little Michaela. And Little Michaela is actually a virtual uh, person. Wow. That's crazy. I, I <laughs> loved how you said that it's a, it's a self portrait. You really, um, yeah, you really said it right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is, this is really interesting for those of you that don't know, there's this kind of emerging, I, I would still call it experimental, the emerging trend of kind of virtual, uh, influencers like CGI created, like people who have opinions and missions and, you know, create stuff and create music. And, and in the case of little Michaela, um, I think she was dreamt up by a team in Southern California and is like a, an online kind of activist and voice and has a huge, huge following on Instagram and puts out music and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, this one was really interesting. So we ended up chatting with the little Michaela team and thought it would be really cool to, to try out doing like a charity auction, like a kind of like a super rare drop for, for charity. Um, and yeah, this dropped like a month ago or a few weeks ago. I think my, my co-founder, John said it best. He was like, this is a great metaverse experiment. <laughs> um, so it's like digital art being dropped by a digital person in a digital art market. And uh, yeah, so she broke the record for highest artwork sale in USD terms. Um, so this sold for about $82,000 three weeks wow. ago. 
And all that money went to Black Girls Code, which is a nonprofit teaching girls to code. Ah, okay. That's amazing. And um, we have talked about the artists and now a lot about the artwork as well, but who are the people who buy this kind of artworks? Do you see like a common threat yeah. going, you know, through all these people who have uh, so much money to spare on, on digital art? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and again, I mentioned my dad earlier. He's just like in disbelief that like, you know, Super is doing about a million dollars every month in volume. So artists are earning, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And that begs the question of who are these uh, collectors doing this? Yeah, I mean... It is a range. We have a, a truly global community. Some collectors are totally anonymous, so it's it's hard to know who they are. Uh, some are are not. They're very vocal and very uh, communicative and present. As far as look, looking for common threads, I would say, you know, a younger generation that's looking for kind of like what's next in art. Um, obviously, into technology, probably into the idea of decentralization and and peer to peer. And in the early days where we still are, you know, this is built on Ethereum. We still transact in, in Ether. Um, and so, you know, many of these people are, are people who probably have large crypto holdings that appreciated a lot in the past five, 10 years. Um, and, you know, if you think about that, it might be easy to say like, oh, well, then it's just, it's like a fad that it's just being fueled by the rise in the price of Bitcoin and, and ETH. But I wouldn't write it off that fast. If you look at the history of the art market, say in the United States, in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, when the United States art market was, was kind of trying or finding its voice and there was a lot of collecting happening, you know, people were collecting from, uh, from overseas in Europe. And then I think in the, like the forties, fifties, it really started to boom more with us artists that was fueled by wealth created in the industrial revolution. Um, so, you know, John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his wife created the New York MoMA. You know, that's the son of the wealthiest man in the world uh, from the John D. Rockefeller from the oil boom, you know, the Carnegie's. And, and so there's this whole generation of people who went rags to riches, completely unprecedented wealth. And we're kind of seeing a digital version happen with that, with the rise of crypto. Um, and I think we're going to see it kind of circle out. So it's not just crypto as far as like, if you think of like younger people who are making money primarily in digital ways, you know, there's like Instagram personalities and YouTube personalities and celebrities that are just making a living online. It's like very natural for them to be gaining wealth online. Um, there's the rise of like esports, So we now have like, you know, teenagers and, and, uh, people in their twenties, you know, earning multi-million dollar figures for, for esports tournaments. So I, I do think there's like the next circle out might be this, this broader circle of, of digital wealth. Um, and then again, it's, it's not just like super, super wealthy people. I mean, the average price, the average artwork price on super has gone up over time. Uh, it's certainly not as high as that, um, well, Michaela piece went for the average price is about a thousand dollars. I think there's this kind of middle segment of, again, there's like the long tail of collectors. And I think if you looked at like the average collector, it's probably looks like somebody like us, like probably has a day job, you know, makes okay money, but has a little bit of extra money to, to invest and, and play around with stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you are the co-founder of the, the platform. So it's not like you have a regular job, right? You have a <laughs> a fast growing yeah, well, startup to manage and uh potential of a big huge upside i assume i wish i had more time to to appreciate and collect art <laughs> yeah okay so you, you but you have some art as well uh obviously you bought some art yeah. as well. okay yeah i'm a collector okay and how does that actually work how much is it tied to the platform of super air if you buy an artwork there yeah one really important thing about NFTs is that they're, um, they can really live anywhere on the internet or on Ethereum. The artwork, like the token is an on-chain asset, um, just like a Bitcoin or an Ether. And if super rare to one day completely go down or servers crash and like the website was no longer there, if you bought an artwork, you still literally have the same token minted by the artist. 
and you can go sell it on another marketplace. You can sell it peer to peer with somebody. And so it's not reliant uh, on super host servers or anything like that. And I think that's a really important piece because if we were say just authenticating artworks and creating entries in our database and as you know, selling the artist was selling them for $10,000 that like that obviously creates a huge counterparty risk and all the crypto people's mm -hmm. alarms would go off. So I think it's a really important piece to underscore, like we're providing a platform for artists to, to mint and we do our best to be the best place to, to do that and the best place to collect and the best kind of market mechanics. But these are totally open, like once they're minted, they're totally open kind of blockchain assets. Um, one, one thing that I think is really interesting is uh, you offer a resale commission to artists. So if you buy an artwork and then resell it to someone else on Super Rare, the artist can still benefit from that appreciation of price of the artwork. How does that work even off the platform? Would that also work? Is it kind of like a, a smart contract? Or yeah, I, I really literally don't know how that works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That was one of the things that we included in our original launch. We didn't have many features, but the artist commission, or it's colloquially called a royalty on secondary sale, where the artists will get uh, 10% of that commission if sold on Super Rare. And we really thought that was a, a truly revolutionary concept because if you think about, you know, the kind of quintessential story or tragedy of the art market is oftentimes an artist and his family don't see much, you know, the upside of the success of his artworks. And then, you know, say sold an artwork for a thousand dollars and then 25 years later, it sells at Christie's for, you know, a hundred million dollars or something like that. And the, the artists and the family get nothing. And so the, the really, really cool thing I think about Ethereum and about smart contracts is that you can have this kind of programmable transaction. And again, this would happen even if super rare totally went away. That's like, that's coded into the smart contract. And as to your question of whether it's kind of industry standard or cross platform, it's currently not. And so that those secondary sale royalties happen if the artwork trades on super rare. But again, I don't think it's really possible to enforce, like truly enforce. And it was actually funny, like. When we were, you know, launching in 2018, there's kind of a swirl of hype around crypto art and NFTs. And many people were like, oh, well, you know, it's not enforceable. So like, why would you do it? And we were like, well, that's dumb. Like we can do it. And like people on the platform are getting royalties and it, it really, really worked. And we were the only ones to do it, you know, like of any platform in the space, we were the only ones to do it. And a lot of people were just kind of like, saying, oh, it's not like bulletproof, you know, attack proof, kind of like Bitcoin sort of mentality, but we were just like, well, it's something, it's a starting point. And then within the past year, it's kind of become standard amongst other crypto art platforms. Like everybody does it now. Oh, really? Okay. That's so cool. And the stats on the super rare website, um, say like the secondary market value was around a million so far. So 10% mm -hmm. of that would go back to the artist. That's amazing. Yeah. There have been cases where the artwork appreciated so much by the secondary sale that the royalty brought more money to the artist than did the original sale. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool uh -huh. to see. And you literally, like, if you're the artist in that case, you, you literally like wake up and you have a thousand dollars and you get an email about it. Like that's a pretty sweet email to get. That's crazy. But um, <laughs> does that just like automatically pay out to you on, on your like Ether wallet? Or when you say you get an email first, is that there's something the person has to do to kind of collect the, the royalty? No, it's, it's, it's instantly paid out as part of the same exact transaction, mm -hmm. the exact transaction, the exact block. Um, so the emails just says like, hey, this happened. Can you a little bit uh, elaborate on the economics of the super ad platform? Also from a business point of view, uh, you are a startup. How many people work there? Like, uh, is it profitable? Is it, um, you know, like kind of those uh, juicy numbers? But yeah, the whole space, including super Air, has seen really incredible growth in 2020 from April, 2018 to, you know, the, the one year mark, the entire market volume was $90,000. And at the time we were kind of like, Hey, $90,000 of art sold on our experimental art market. Like that's kind of, that's kind of amazing. 
Um, in, in 2019, almost hundred thousand dollars in one year. And then. Yeah. And fast forward to 2020, we were starting to do about a hundred K a month in volume. So artists started selling, you know, $100,000 a month of art and then it's 10 X since there. So now the past three months or so we've broken over a million dollars in sales a month. Mm -hmm. Um, and these numbers are tiny compared to anything in the traditional art market. And the, the number of users is extremely tiny compared to numbers of other kind of social web platforms. Um, but yeah, as far as our team, we've also grown quite a bit this year for a long time. We were like extremely small and scrappy team. We've been able to hire some folks this year. We're about 10 people now and we're hiring. So if you are interested, hit us up, go to our website and, uh, find our Twitter and, and say hi. What kind of people are you looking for? Engineers? Yeah, we're looking for passionate, creative people. We're very heavy in engineering, design, product, um, community. Cool. And Jonathan, I think that's a good place also to ask you a little bit about your bio in a very quick way. Like, what is your background? How did you end up um, in the digital art market? You mentioned before you are a musician. You have a background also in art. Um, can you give us a short, snappy bio? Sure, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the common thread through my career has been creativity and technology. So I'm a musician. I've always played in bands. I'm a drummer. I went to college in San Francisco and studied digital media arts, caught the entrepreneurship bug, and taught myself to code after college. I did a couple of startup experiments in San Francisco and ended up moving to New York and was just working as a software engineer. Along the line, I fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole like around 2013 and got pretty into Ethereum when it came out in 2015. And my co-founders and I, um, who are incidentally my cousins. Oh, really? Um, okay. We're all family business. Yeah. We were all living in Brooklyn around the time Ethereum came out and we would get together on the weekends and and spitball and, and, uh, always talked about doing something. And uh, yeah, in 2017, obviously there was like the big run up in, in prices, but one thing that really stood out to us was the, the launch of CryptoPunks. For those not familiar, CryptoPunks is a pioneering art on blockchain project. It's a series of 10,000 computer generated punks. So like little avatars, like really cool looking artworks. Each one is a, a token on Ethereum. And so this predated the NFT standard that came later. Mm. We thought that was really cool. And like, we, you know, we're talking about that and talking about, uh, rare Pepe's, which is actually a predecessor, you know, even earlier, there has been this kind of like tinkering, uh, underground art movements happening on the blockchain later in 2017, crypto kitties launched, which is more of a game, but you know, technology wise, very similar. And, you know, by the time Crypto Kitties had already launched, we had already like been working on a early prototype of what would become super rare. And yeah, we launched in April, 2018. But I mean, that's quite, you have to really looking far into the future to believe at that point that digital art, I mean, I think everybody was talking at that time, Hey, uh, what will be the first thing? Those NFTs, uh, in video games, right? Um, I don't know, collectibles, uh, like yeah. digitizing baseball cards, but you guys were like, no, 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 let's put something more abstract. I mean, art, let's put that on the blockchain. <laughs> How did that happen? What was the thinking behind that? Yeah, you have, you have a good memory. You're exactly right. In in 2018, when we launched, people were like, we talked to investors and other people in the space and they'd be like, did you say art? Like, like what, like, what are you guys doing? Like, do you hate money? Like, what, <laughs> like, why would you do that to yourselves? Like clearly NFTs are for gaming. Um, and we were just like, no, we think this art thing is cool. Obviously games are is enormous, enormous industry, but each game is, is still kind of niche and you have to really believe in the studio that made it. If you're into crypto kitties, you have to really be into the thing that this company is making themselves. And like, that's kind of like how games work, obviously. And if you look at platforms like Instagram, the power of Instagram is truly that it's a platform. You don't really care about Instagram or like Facebook or whatever. Like you could hate Mark Zuckerberg, but if you follow Beyonce on Instagram, 
you're consuming stuff that Beyonce made. And it's cool because Beyonce made it. Mm -hmm. And if we can bring even a percentage of what this dynamic is that um, has brought like billions of people onto Instagram and these media platforms, then this can be like the most mainstream blockchain application. And that, that was kind of the inspiration for it. Hmm. That's interesting. And how does one become a financially successful digital artist? Let's give some tips for the artists listening out there. I would say be authentic, embrace the new medium. You know, some people speculate that once the traditional art people figure this out, it's going to be all over for these early adopters. And I don't think that's true at all. You know, if you look at people who are really successful on YouTube, it's not people who are really successful on, on cable networks. Mm. It's a completely new medium. I think you have to promote yourself more. Like we talked about before, if you could get into a gallery, then you kind of had it made and people sold your stuff. It is kind of akin to being a band or musician these days where you have to be touring and putting stuff out all the time and starting conversations and putting your personality out there because it really, like you said, it's about the art, but it's also hugely about the story yeah. and about the, about the person behind the art. So yeah, let the story shine through. Ethereum, crypto in general is very permissionless. That's one of the core values. What I understand from Super Air is as an artist, I cannot just sign up and I'll just put out my artworks there. You act in that sense as a gatekeeper at the moment. I feel like you want to get rid of that and make it possible for everyone. Is that right? And if so, how do you get there? Yeah, you're exactly right. Super Air started out very exclusive. You know, like I said, in the early days, we were manually kind of interviewing and onboarding people to be creators. Now we're adding people at a higher volume, but there's still pretty big limitations on how many people we can add over time. Before talking about where I think it's going, I'll just explain like why that's the case. And so it's easy to say, oh, these jerks, they're, you know, trying to exclude these poor artists that just want to make money. There's a couple of things going on. One is that the whole premise of Super Air is that it's authentic art like genuinely created by the creator you see listed there and, and whose wallet you can see, you know, like verify on Etherscan. Um, and uh, there have been a, a few experiments in the NFT space where the, the barrier to creating NFTs is completely uh, removed and you can literally go create NFTs based on anything you want. And it turns out unsurprisingly that people see it as a money minting opportunity and they'll just find other people's cool art and create an NFT of, uh, about it and try to sell it. And there's this problem with fraud. The number one most important thing in this space is to, to grow it and bring more collectors in. When we started out, there was almost no collector market. You know, artists were kind of collecting from each other and there's this sense of what are you trying to sell me here? I can just download this JPEG. There's no market for this stuff. Like why would I pay money for this silly token? Our hypothesis from the early days is if we maintain a focus on authenticity that you're Yes, this is crazy. It's kind of like buying Bitcoin in 2011 or whatever. But if you like help them understand that this is really revolutionary, this is really genuine. Like you can talk to the artists. They literally meant they took MetaMask themselves and like minted this artwork. Then you can get a foothold of a real market. And I think without that focus, we wouldn't have gotten a foothold and there wouldn't really be a, a, a real market here. Uh, we're working on doing a number of design changes to scale the platform, make it more personalized, make it more curated. So uh, once we make several changes to the platform later this year, then I think the ability to onboard artists at a much higher rate will be, will be possible. Mm -hmm. um, but you will still have to decide, we let this person on yes or no. It's not like everybody can just become an artist, right? There will, I guess, <laughs> always be this uh, kind of gatekeeper functionality, just like a gallery does or a museum has to do. I cannot just walk in a museum and say, hey, this is my artwork. Yeah, I mean, but it doesn't always have to be us, you know? It is a tricky problem to solve, but if there are ways to do it, you know, say there's guests or there's areas that are like authenticated by this curator or, you know, like it doesn't always have to be the team that's building the software. Like what we really think we're good at is giving tools to artists and collectors, helping connect people. We're not claiming that we think we're the best uh, curators or anything like that. We're, we're really trying to foster an ecosystem where many, many different types of art and tastes can flourish. And if you think about a platform like Spotify, I can listen to heavy metal 
on Spotify. And then, you know, you can listen to piano jazz on Spotify, but it's Spotify is neither a place for heavy metal or piano jazz. Like it's, it's, it's a place to go find what you want mm -hmm. and connect with the, the, the types of art you want to experience. Yeah. Okay. So also with the recommender function, I'll see the stuff that I like and other people will see stuff they like, etc. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot to build, but I certainly think this space is going to become truly enormous. And so there's going to be room for many, many different types of art that's going to, mm -hmm. I think, continue to surprise us. Cool. So let's jump in the new segment on this podcast. I asked Jonathan to make a little bit room for, for ideas. What could be built? What could be cool? What have you seen that kind of like inspired you that we could talk about? Yeah, for sure. I'm happy to be a guinea pig on the new, new segment of the podcast. I love it. Yeah. So first, you know, you mentioned kind of like what, what other projects do I find fascinating in the space or like other, you know, people doing really cool stuff. In our immediate space, there's a platform called Async Art, which is really, really interesting, it is kind of similar to Super Air, but all the art is programmable and interactive. And so each one has different layers. They call them like layers and a master. Um, so there's actually several tokens for artwork, even though it's all one artwork. The person who owns each layer can push a button on it and then the artwork for the whole audience visually changes. So there's kind of this like ownership participation. There's an async token made by Matt Kane that changes based on the volatility of the price of Bitcoin. I think the URL is volatility.art and yeah, so the artwork like responds and changes in, in all these like really interesting visual ways based on that. We've talked a lot about, at Super Rare too about enabling art that's um, code based where, you know, say you, you can have an artwork that changes in a random way every time it changes hands. Mm -hmm. So you can collect it, but it's going to look different by the time it's in your wallet and then it's a surprise, uh, you know, just stuff like that. Okay. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And then other stuff, I think what's happening in the virtual world space is super interesting. There's been this kind of Cambrian explosion of, um, virtual worlds powered by NFTs, you know, Decentraland, crypto voxels, Somnium space. There's, there's a bunch and, you know, there's some overlap with gaming, some overlap with VR, some overlap with crypto art. Is that what you, you mentioned earlier? You, you said that word meta state or meta, what was that? Yeah. The metaverse, the metaverse, metaverse. that, that has to do with that, right? That's kind of connected. Yeah. So I don't know if it originated from here, but there, there's a book in the early nineties called snow crash. It's kind of about the metaverse and it's just this like virtual kind of like second life. So second life, if you're familiar with that is a game. Uh, from the 2000s that, you know, let people have an avatar and walk around and have this like second life mm. as the name implies. And it got pretty popular, but it didn't really take off and last. And one thing that may be different now is that, like I said, there's, there's scarcity and the ability to have value in these worlds. And so, you know, Decentraland, I think they're the first one I heard of anyway, like they did a huge ICO and additionally sold land. And the idea is that like, if the world gets adoption, then the land is going to have a lot of value. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, if you could buy land in New York city back in the day, you're going to, if you hold a lot of it, you're going to be doing pretty well because everyone wants to be in New York city. What's really been wild is, is seeing the kind of like symbiotic relationship between these virtual worlds and the crypto art market. Um, I think they're mutually beneficial because these developers started making these virtual worlds. And then all of a sudden you have these buildings with nothing on the walls. And in the early days of super rare, we have all this art, but like no walls to hang them on, so to speak <laughs> on, the, on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this phenomenon started happening where artists and collectors were going to crypto voxels, uh, Decentraland and Somnium space and these places and building galleries and like tweeting about the galleries and stuff. And, and for a while on our team, we were like, oh, wow, there's something really going on here. Like there's real community building on it and kind of experimenting with, with galleries in, in the virtual space. So you walk yeah. in that virtual world and then you have a virtual wall and on that virtual wall is virtual artwork. Yeah. And we, we do virtual exhibitions all the time. So we have a museum in Decentraland. It's a seven story space that we do events and parties and virtual exhibitions. And do you own the, like super air owning that space in Decentraland or how is that working? 
Yeah, we know the team pretty well and they were keen on making kind of like an arts district. So they were super generous. I think it's like technically on loan and uh, yeah, that's how we made that happen. So what was first there in Decentraland? Was it art or porn? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Actually, Crypto Voxels was the one that really took the crypto art world by storm. If you haven't seen it before, it's visually inspired, I think, by Minecraft. Yeah. So it's like this really pixelated 8-bit kind of like 3D like visual space. And I think it was like just kind of like an under-the-radar project. There was one developer named Ben Nolan, like coded up mm -hmm. himself. Wow. Um, no ICO, nothing like that. That's crazy. Sometimes one person has like kind of this great influence all, over all the other projects it's also in DeFi sometimes yeah right? and then you know com a community can form around mm -hmm. it and it's off to the races it's pretty cool okay so you really think about this metaverse i haven't really dug really deep into that i think that should be maybe the next stop for me yeah it's a it's a rabbit hole for sure <laughs> maybe you can give you know like a little shout out or instructions for people who listen what should they do uh, to follow you where, where they could dabble in digital art maybe if they're interested in that for sure um if uh, anyone's interested in learning more about super rare our website is superrare.co and you can also follow us on twitter at super rare check out the artworks you can easily sign up with an ethereum account get started collecting, can play some bids and dive in. And it's a really vibrant community. Also on the website, you'll find the link to our Discord server. That's the best place if you want to really learn more and chat with people in the community and chat with us, uh, hop into our Discord and, and say what's up. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It was a pleasure. Ah, thanks so much for having me on. It was a good combo. <laughs> good chatting with you. This is super fun. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Can I just close this or does it need to uh, um, upload or anything? I'll just close and then it will automatically upload. I don't. Oh, you're still here. That's cool. Do you want to play a game? Choose between one, two, or three. Just imagine the number in your head. Okay. Did you pick your number? Okay, ready. If you have imagined one, Please go to unforkable.cc and sign up for the mailing list. If you have chosen the number two, go to Apple Podcast and leave a glowing review. And finally, if you have picked number three, go to cryptovalley.jobs and check out the jobs that are currently available on the site. You can also sign up for a job notification if you're interested. So thank you for listening to the end. I really do appreciate it. See you the next time.